Hello, it's an incredible honor to receive this award and I'm happy to speak about our work. I wanna begin by thanking all of the people that contributed in so many ways to have me get this award. In particular, I wanna thank my family. I wanna thank my advisor, Dinesh Pai, all of the faculty and colleagues at the institutions I've ever been at. I'm incredibly grateful to all the things that you did to help me. I also wanna thank the students who have done so much to actually get all these projects done. So many of them have been incredibly difficult to do is an understatement. And they did such incredible work. And because of that, we get to enjoy so many of these advances. So thank you. I first got into computer graphics in a fairly indirect way. Uh, I tried everything else first. I was driven by curiosity and physics and math and just modeling things and eventually wanting to simulate things. Uh, this worked out well for a lot of the applications we explored, you know, obviously. Um, but initially, as an applied math student, I was exposed to a range of sort of standard problems that had a bunch of funny side effects if you actually did intend to solve them. So I really wanted to find applications that I could solve problems that wouldn't harm people and then also have fun in, along the way. And it turned out that computer graphics was a perfect place for somebody that took a funny path like me. Uh, my first SIGGRAPH paper was Art Defo in 99 with Dinesh, and this was a crazy paper. I don't think anybody was harmed by this work, except maybe the reviewers. The paper showed up without a video. Later, I submitted a video to the Animation Festival. Of course, that's not the same thing as a technical papers program, but somehow both of them got in, and the rest is history. The examples in this paper are probably the weirdest of any that we've written, um, and it was it was a fun and... Uh, you know, fun time where I learned a lot along the way. Around this time, I became obsessed with how fast you could compute things, you know, order end methods, things like that. But for interactive stuff, I thought that the most important thing was to pre-compute things so that you had the answers or you knew things ahead of time, especially for interactive applications. That was the thing. And so I believe that you could pre-compute systems and come up with algorithms which would ultimately be slower, but would allow you to map certain outputs uh, to certain inputs in an efficient way, maybe explain the structure that certain inputs like the contact forces are the only non-serial things in a certain point-like location. And this led to these methods where we could pre-compute these linear systems of elastic models and figure out how every vertex would respond if it was pushed in X, Y, or Z direction. And we could pre-compute these Green's functions and sparsify them with wavelets and then do fast summations and low rank updates for haptics and, and uh, force feedback. And it was, it was a fun set of methods. A decade and a half later at Pixar, these ideas of pre-computing point light greens function responses was super useful. But now instead of pre-computing a response for a specific geometry using some discrete methods, we could pre-compute the responses analytically by hand or in Mathematica to know how this brush would deform this elastic space the character was embedded in. And this was super useful for sculpting and posing and super fast too, because it was all known analytically. Anyway, back to pre-computation. I thought you could pre-compute complicated nonlinear dynamics and motion and lighting and collisions and encode it and compress it and put it on the GPU. The problem was it was hard to encode interactions. So we tried impulses, but that was very limited. We also looked at how to get databases of motion, which was very hard to pre-compute at the time and then do motion graphs on this. One big problem I had was how to touch reduced order models that were simulated on the GPU. The GPU was so fast, but I couldn't actually interact with the objects because it was only deformed and lit just prior to being put on the screen. So how could I interact with it on the CPU to touch it or feel it with a force feedback device? Actually, Pink Floyd recognized this problem much earlier and expressed slightly differently. But to paraphrase, essentially, if you don't deform your mesh, you can't find any collisions. How can you find any collisions if you don't deform your mesh? So what, we weren't doing that on the CPU, and so this was the problem. Bounded deformation trees were the breakthrough that allowed us to simply bound the deformed geometry without having to actually 
deform all the triangles, update a hierarchy on them in order to do collision detection and find out nothing was touching. We could simply update the bounds using the parameters of the reduced coordinate models and then use that to call in an output sensitive way that didn't require us to deform the quarter billion triangles in this example here that were all deformed and lit on the GPU. Next, to support large deformations, we found ways to pre-compute nonlinear finite element models using dimensional model reduction. So this gave us low rank approximations and massive speed ups. We basically projected the dynamics into low dimensional subspace and approximated the forces. For linear model analysis, this is trivial. For large deformations, we could use St. Fanon Kirchhoff, and this gave us cubic force polynomials, which we could pre-compute the coefficients of. Yurne Barbic was able to use this to do real-time haptic rendering using the bounded deformation trees on point shells for fast reduced order collision detection while rendering on the GPU all the deformations. For general nonlinear materials, you're stuck with evaluating the forces at all the vertices and then projecting them down into the subspace to get the reduced order forces. But we found a way to just use a sparse set of points by optimizing cubature for specific domains and specific force models. So you could just find a magic set of points and weights to do these integrals, and that gave you better performance than STVK and allowed us to scale up to higher ranks for sound synthesis and other applications like reduced order domain decomposition. <laughs> Around 2006, I started thinking about yarn level cloth with Steve Marshner. Cloth had been forever simulated as an elastic sheet with texture applied. And, you know, people looked at ways to time step it faster, resolve collisions, uh, deal with robustness, parallelize things, and just generally make it go faster by cutting corners. It was mostly a solved problem, people thought. But Steve was like, look at this cloth. It doesn't look like any of the simulated models. Uh, you know, full disclosure, it was Ithaca, we were probably both wearing sweaters, but, you know, the, he had a point that, you know, if we wanted to simulate this detail, we'd have to simulate all the yarns. And I remember saying that would be crazy, it'd be super expensive, but he said, yeah, but it would be the right way to do it. And so then we started to simulate yarn level cloth. And it led to this result in SIGGRAPH 2008. And we also looked at, you know, ways to speed it up and improve the you know, models that we could generate beyond just, you know, scarves, at mostly in the beginning, a lot of scarves, lots of scarves. It was also really slow. So in order to make it faster, we had to find ways to resolve all these collisions. Um, there's so many collisions between all these splines. And basically, there's all these contact forces has to be gathered using some force summation. And this was incredibly slow and it had to happen at every time step and the time steps were tiny. So we looked at ways to exploit temporal coherence to track the local frame of the contacts and build some adaptive asynchronous integration scheme that allowed us to figure out where contacts were changing and put work there and not other places. The student, Jonathan Calder, was amazing. He was able to implement the first systems and do all this adaptive stuff as well. Next, Jem Yuxel joined us and helped model more complicated patterns. His work on stitch meshes encoded topology using polygons, which could be easily used to model arbitrary patterns. And then these could be instantiated on geometry and inflated with physics in order to generate these interesting yarn level patterns that you just could not draw by hand. So this saved us from the simple, you know, scarves and blankets that we've been working with and allowed us to have more complicated patterns. Years later, we were able to actually achieve interactive rates using fast, massively multi-threaded GPU implementations of yarn level cloth and periodic boundaries. So then you, you could design these interactive patterns and watch them appear before your eyes and adjust the patterns and see the changes. And this was really exciting to see. At this year's SIGGRAPH, we have a paper on fast linking numbers that can help detect pull-throughs of loops such as this chain mail, but also in yarn level cloth where you have two rows of a knitted sweater that pull through, you can detect this change in their linking number and, and verify the correctness of the simulation. And this works in really challenging scenarios too, and you don't have to wait for it to blow up to find out. <laughs> sound. sound is such an important part of how we perceive our environment. When it's missing, it, it, it's just terrible. 
But fundamentally, when we started a lot of this work on sound synthesis, there were no methods to simulate all kinds of different effects from computer animation, things like fracture and whatnot. The whole community was basically making visual uh, animation methods that lack sound because sound had always been treated like an afterthought. It was essentially post-production added after the fact, like some old silent movie still a century later. The work that we tried to do is basically to revisit the whole computer animation pipeline for physics-based animation and model all the missing vibrations and radiation to produce a system for animating things with sound. Here are some results. We revisited our water simulations with two-phase flows. But eventually found that time domain radiation worked much better for water and captured more interesting effects. One problem was that we had different methods for different phenomena, but nothing to render all of them together. So unlike rendering where people built systems that could render whatever you could see and could integrate many different primitives and phenomena, in sound we didn't have that. So that led to this work on an integrated wave solver, which could render anything that we could put in our system. So whatever interface was vibrating, we could generate the sound from it in a very low noise way. We captured interesting scattering effects, and we even have a parallel in time synthesis approach that could window vibrations. And just like you can render frames in parallel visually, you could also do that with sound now. Recently, we had a breakthrough in how to compute acoustic transfer for vibrating solids. The basic problem is that if you have a, a modal model, it has a bunch of frequencies that it vibrates at, and you have to compute the acoustic transfer using the Helmholtz equation for each one of them. And this can be really slow, even using fast multipole method. In our new solver, what we can do is we can take distinct frequencies and pack them into chords and then simulate those in the time domain on the GPU. So we have fewer simulations to perform and we get good GPU parallelism. The results can then be deconflated using uh, least squares methods. The end result is massive speed up over traditional frequency domain Helmholtz solvers. And this allows us to get thousands times speed up so that now on a single machine, you can compute the results for 68,000 vibrations in only two hours, as opposed to over a year uh, using traditional fast boundary element methods. <laughs> I want to end by talking about how to pick problems. Keep in mind that things change fast, so you always want to think bigger. 15 years went from that to that, and even methods which are slow now will ultimately become fast. So you could literally sit on the couch and just wait and things will get faster. So are you faster than an army of couch potatoes? Because they're ultimately going to come for you, right? They're going to get faster and faster even if you don't do anything. Furthermore, you're also competing with thousands of really smart people which are gonna do everything anyway, but you don't have to compete with them, just use them as your own research lab. They're gonna do all these things and then all you need to do are things which are different. Those are the things that are gonna expand the space and advance ideas faster. That's where you wanna focus your energy. Avoid the inevitable stuff. If it's gonna happen if you don't do it anyway, 
If you die tomorrow, it'll happen. Why do it? Find the things that are different. Those are the important things for you to try to explore. If you think of the whole space of where everybody's working, there's all these different areas. You can contribute in there and get citations and whatever, but really the ideas that are outside those areas are the ones that we want to push into. Those are the ones that have moved the space forward. So I know you need to write a lot of papers and that's you know how you get tenure and stuff, but nobody's going to weigh it. And I think the ideas that really push the field further are those ones that are just so much more different. Those are the ones you want to try to get to. Let me conclude by saying that if you pick hard or impossible problems, you'll be forced to be creative and essentially solve a weird riddle. So many good ideas often come with their own really weird riddles, where essentially you're finding an unexpected answer to the wrong question. Uh, the fastest way to multiply a dense matrix is never form it. The fastest way to simulate is to do it yesterday. The fastest way to check for collisions is to know you don't have to do things or not do things at all. And so there's all these delightful little answers to these riddles when you come up with these things. And I hope that you enjoy this and find your own. Uh, and finally, thank you for listening. And I, I hope you have a good SIGGRAPH and a, a good year. Take care. Bye-bye.